Um, having this great database, which is gigabytes uh, big, because I knew nine years ago when I started that we were making history, and it had to be preserved, um, I got, get called upon often. Um, we had, uh, David Hoffman had some jokes about uh, when they were looking for some rare document that someone had, some email that someone had sent years ago and couldn't find it, they'd come to me and I would say, oh, here it is. Um, but I'm not gonna talk about the facts and details today, given I've only, only got a few minutes. So I wanna talk about two um, things. One is the reaction. Many of you know that when the board of the APA was about to receive the Hoffman Report, uh, which uh, they invited two of us, Stephen Reisner, who's on the Council of Representatives, and myself, to speak with them on the implications of the report and uh, recommendations that we had for how the APA should respond to it. Um, we had a period of negotiation with their uh, high-priced lawyers, um, trying to work out uh, agreeable uh, terms and conditions around uh, limited confidentiality, et cetera. And a few days before, um, I believe it was on June 28th, if that was the Sunday night, got access to a uh, online version of the Hoffman Report. It was still in a f near final draft at that point. Um, and so was, Stephen and I were furiously reading it in our spare time over the next few days. And it was quite an experience, but what I remember most about it was the extreme fluctuation of mood um, from absolute elation that after nearly a decade of devoting my life and others devoting their lives to this issue, after being called um, among the best of the terms we were called by the past president of the APA, those who will never be satisfied, um, that we were in 528 or whatever the final version pages, we were vindicated in, in many terms in great detail. So there'd be this elation and then there would be this profound sadness. I was crying. Um, sometimes I was crying out of relief um, and sometimes out of just profound sadness that this, was, that this had occurred, that both the psychology profession and the APA had fallen to this level, that in fact sadness that all of our beliefs about what had been going on were in fact true, that APA leaders were working behind the scenes with um, uh, defense and intelligence officials to undermine the ethics of the profession, the will of the membership, and the will of the council. And my wife was driven crazy as my mood was up and down, and, and she asked me how I was feeling one minute, it would be totally different, and she couldn't fathom what was going on. But it was just, it was, it was a profound experience went through there, and I suspect many of us we, I, um, went through some variant and some mixture of those intense emotions as we dealt with this because there, you know, as I say, there is the relief to, of being vindicated, but it should never have happened. Um, things should never have gotten to this point. The lies, the deceit, and the manipulation should never have gotten to this point. So there's one other thing in my limited time I want to talk about, which goes to, at the broadest level, and some of the issues that um, Yosef was referring to. This is one of the lessons of this scandal, and I, th I think I'm the one who's probably referred to this the most. I, I, one of the experiences I had here was I, um, in probably around 2008 or somewhere, to, somewhere in there, I spoke at a, uh, a week-long retreat at a, uh, a fundamentalist Christian college in Nebraska. Um, and I found out that I was actually the first secular speaker they had ever had in their 150 year history of this college. Um, and it was a very moving experience, but the president asked me, what do you want? And I said, one thing I want is to end the involvement of psychologists in torture and abusive interrogations. 
The second thing I want is to, um, is to change the APA so that this type of thing doesn't happen again. Change the structure, the functions, the culture of the APA. But the third thing I wanted was to deal, to get the profession, our profession, to deal at a very profound level with its ethical roots. Because I feel as a profession we have never done that. That um, we, ethics in our profession is largely in the form of risk management. Um, those who knew Stephen Benke, he was great if you had a consultation, and I, and I heard him many times say, if, if this colleague does this, they will be safe. Um, it was about what, what things you had to do to not get into trouble. But what I didn't hear, and what I think there is very little in reality in our ethics textbooks and our ethics courses, is about how do you really think about um, what are the bases of what we do as, as psychologists and what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Because this episode, the involvement with torture, with interrogations, with national security, really poses profound questions about are there things that shouldn't be done by anyone, torture, things that maybe intelligence agents do do, but psychologists, because they have certain ethical principles and a certain role in society based on that, and a certain trust based on that, shouldn't do. And then, additionally, are there things that, as a society, we don't want psychologists or anyone to do in terms of manipulating people and um, changing people, which is especially important as the technology and the ability to actually affect people grows. And I think that we need to use this opportunity to open up that broader debate. And what I've always said is I don't have the answers to those questions. But I do know that we as a profession, with input from the wider society, need to engage in that deep thought. Um, what is it that makes psychologists, psychological work unique morally? And are there limits to what we are willing to do and what we should do? And so then I'm going to end with that thought.